Hello and welcome to Life Church Today. Life Church Today wants to make a lasting difference in your life, in our community, and in the world. Our mission is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's how Life Church Today is able to make a difference in the lives of so many people, and it's the motivating dynamic behind everything that we do. You see, church isn't merely a building, it's the people. So we aim to bring church to you. We meet around the globe online and in physical locations throughout America. No matter how and where you join Life Church today, you will find friendly people who are excited to get to know you as you become part of the Life Church family. And wherever you are in life, you matter to God and you have a purpose to fulfill. Life Church today wants to help you become the person God has created you to be. Every journey, including yours, has a next phase and will help you discover it. It could start with simple things like serving, praying, or writing, finding God's vision for you. You will not have to take the next step by yourself. With a solid community of friends, you can smile, grow, and serve with people who sincerely care about you. Enjoy the sermons, read the devotions, reach out and contact us. We respond to every single person who writes us or find a group to join you on your faith journey. Worship, give, and love. Our community and world. We are excited about serving the world's community and offering God's love to people of all backgrounds, whether online, in person, individually, or in groups. Within our church and around the globe, we are focused on supporting and engaging in relationships that provide assistance and restoration to the hurting world. Our caring leadership team, including lead pastor Mike Robinson, works together to shape the vision and direction of Life Church today. Pastor Robinson, author of 40 books, serves with a team of enthusiastic and educated ministers using their numerous years' experience. They aim to serve you and your whole family. Visit lifechurchtoday.com. And they're all, it's also a link to the outline on the Facebook page, and it's on the website when you go under the About and look for sermons. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It's near the top. In fact, it is the top of your outline. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Hear the reading of God's holy, infallible, perfect word. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, stay standing, and I want you to look at somebody kind of close to you, look them up and down a bit, and then tell them this with some enthusiasm. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. In Christ, you are incredible. You're incredible. You have great potential. God's love is in you. His power and joy. His destiny. And you're just getting started. Let's come together in Christ today and make our church better. Make our church better. Make our town better. Make our town better. Let's do this. Let's do this together. Amen and amen. You can see on your way down, give a high five or a handshake or a hug or something. <laughs> this is July 4th week. I don't know when the actual holiday is. I think it's Wednesday, right? Yes. The birth of America. We would not be here if it wasn't for the founding fathers, and so many of them were godly. Some of them had obviously some problems with the Masons, but many of them were very, very strong Christians. Benjamin Franklin said this. He was a signer of the Declaration, the signer of the Constitution, and he said this. As for Jesus of Nazareth, my opinion of whom you particularly desire, I think the system of morals and his religion has left them to us is the best the world ever saw and is likely to see. Now Samuel Adams, he's known for more than just beer, he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, he was called the father of the American Revolution, ratifier of the United States Constitution, this is what Samuel Adams said, he said, I rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ for a pardon of all my sins, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, where the righteous flee and are safe. Let us secure his favor, and he will lead us through the journey of this life at the length and receive us to the better. And then he said, I cannot conceive 
we cannot better express ourselves than by promoting the holy and happy period when the kingdoms of our Lord and Jesus Christ may be everywhere established and the people willingly bow to the scepter of him who is a prince of peace. So that's what Samuel said, Samuel Adams. Charles Carroll, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, a framer of the Bill of Rights, he said this, On the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for salvation on his merits, not of works that I have done, but of obedience to his and faith and all that is all. And then he said this, his will and his testament, he said this. This is a signer of the Declaration of Independence, including a framer of the Bill of Rights. Charles Carroll said this, his last will and testament. He said, I, Charles Carroll, give my soul to God who gave it, my body to the earth, hoping that through and by the merits and sufferings and mediation of my only Savior, Jesus Christ, I may be admitted into the kingdom prepared by God for those who love and fear and truly serve Him. Amen. So that's how it was birthed in 1776, this country. Yet many non-believers these days are fighting against all the principles of the Founding Fathers. The old joke where the airplane captain said to the passengers, this is your captain speaking, and we're flying at 34,000 feet above and about 650 miles per hour. I have some good news and bad news for you. The bad news is we're lost. The good news is we're making excellent time. <laughs> and that's what we see those in the political realm scrambling about when they're not building what they want to do through the Christian worldview. See, God's word must be imprinted on our culture like it was in 1776. The birth of this nation was through the providence of God in prayer and became the greatest country in history of the world. Not a perfect country by far because it's filled with people, but the greatest country in history. During the Constitutional Convention, progress was stalled. They didn't know what to do. An 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin stood up, holding onto the arm of his chair, and exhorted the Founding Fathers. He said, I quote, I therefore beg henceforth prayers, imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing every morning. And all the Founding Fathers agreed, and they did that every morning, and they reached the Constitution, and then they were able to go forward. Amen. Every dollar bill in your pocket has in God we trust printed on it. The message in God we trust comes from the Bible. And it means the man in the White House or the people in the Congress or in City Hall or the police station should trust in God and not mock God for God will not be mocked because people will reap what they sow. Amen. Now, John Dickinson, a signer of the Constitution and a general in the American Revolution, he said this, rendering thanks to my creator for my existence and station among his works for the birth of my country, enlightened by the gospel, and enjoying freedom and all of his other kindnesses, to him I resign myself, humbly confining in his goodness and his mercy through Jesus Christ for the events of eternity. Another founding fathers. So we must go back to trusting God in our country, the great God in heaven and him alone. Look on your outline there in Psalm 56, verse 11, it says this. In God I put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Our forefathers lived and fought and died for this simple phrase, in God we trust. They died so you and I could have civil liberties and freedom of speech and religion. The freedom to praise Jesus, to preach Jesus, and to follow him privately as well as publicly. George Washington said, I quote, that it's impossible to rightly govern our country without God in the Bible. If the founding father of our country could step out of his grave and walk down the street in Virginia and tell those transgender protesters what is up, he would be probably attacked and assaulted and run out of town. Things have changed greatly. Today, Washington, Lincoln, as well as the founding fathers would be told to stifle it and take their boots off and go enter a mosque and worship Allah because you cannot mention Jesus Christ publicly without getting rebuked. It makes you a hater if you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. In much of our media, in our politically correct society, in our everything goes ultra tolerant, free for all, mass media, everything is okay except for Christianity. Have you noticed that? Everything goes except for Christianity. So we need to go back to what the Founding Fathers said. This is what Patrick Henry said. He said, the Bible is worth more than all the other books that have ever been printed. That's Patrick Henry. 
The Bible is God's word. It's God's standard for righteousness. The great I am and the high and lofty one is saying to America, if you want my blessings, let the gospel go forth from coast to coast in every town and city and state. And that's what we should stand for. And that's what we should aim for. And that's what we should pray for. Somebody can say amen. 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 See, it's time for the church to rise. As you can turn on the news, if you can stand for a couple minutes. And you see the forces of darkness want to destroy the Constitution, want to outlaw the Word of God, want to destroy the traditional family, and want to destroy our godly heritage. Yes, we understand that some of the Founding Fathers were Masons and had problems in areas, and we're not all Orthodox Christians. Yet within the founding of the country was a structure and the foundation of the Christian worldview. And so understand that. Whatever they did good was based on the Bible. Whatever they did bad was against the Bible, and so it is today. So we need to go back to the Bible, back to Jesus, and see this imprint in our country. And the whole point is for the young people to get a revelation, maybe a revival in their hearts and their yeah, minds man. and their lives, right. and see this country change instead of accepting all this nonsense. It's time for the righteous, the redeemed, the godly to say enough is enough. For Jesus is the King, eternal, immortal, the only wise God. And we will preach the gospel to every creature from sea to shining sea, from New York to L.A., from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, from the streets to the beach, from our homes to the parks. The gospel must go out. And it's simply this, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again. And his love we must bring to everybody that we see and have contact with. That's our duty, that's our job, and that should be our delight. Amen. Somebody say amen. 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 See, I have a hopeful, hope-filled view, even though there's a whole bunch of horrible things going on and everything can just break loose at any minute. I have a hopeful view because I'm praying for a revival. Many leaders in the church throughout America think there might be a revival before the end of the end. I hope they're right. In 1643, representatives from all the colonies met in New England, and they wrote the New England Confederation that stated this, I quote, We all came into these parts of America with one and the same end and aim, namely, to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey. Sorry leftists, sorry progressives, sorry ACLU that you weren't around to sue them at that time. But that's what they said. Yes, we see nefarious things in our culture. Yes, many hate God. Yes, there's wars and rumors of wars. But I'm praying for a marvelous revival. And revival is simply this, people who end up loving Jesus with a passion, loving the Word of God, and having to simply share His love and His mercy and His grace. That's what you have to do. When you're not sharing His love and His mercy and His grace with those in your life, you have to check yourself. Check yourself and see what's going on. See if you need a wake-up call. So on this July 4th week, America needs a wake-up call. Winston Churchill said the soundest sleep he ever had was the night that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. No, he did not delight in the tragic deaths and the evil attack, but he knew, he knew this would wake up America, and it did. And my prayer is that America would wake up, most of all, the church would wake up, that all of us would take Jesus seriously, that you would fall in love with Jesus again, deeply, passionately, fervently, that Jesus would truly be everything to you, and he'd be so much to you that you must share his love and his grace and his truth with others, that you have no other option because his love has overcome you, it's overwhelmed you, it's changed you, and you have to express that love to others. Amen. Amen. So I know that God will hear our prayers one way or the other. Either way, our job is to pray and to love others, to keep it simple. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 says this, Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Either way, our appointment is, the commission we have, is to bring comfort and love to people, hurting people. They're really, really hurting. Even those who look mean and nasty and belligerent, they're the ones that are hurting the most. They really, really need the Lord Jesus. Yes. And so you have to pray for them and yes. comfort them and tell them the good news. Look on your outline on Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. The Word of God says this, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. Hey. This literally means in the Hebrew, God says, Behold me, look at me. How does the prophet Isaiah tell us to find joy? Look to God. Behold God. For He creates a new heaven and a new earth. They're new. 
the old, tarnished, wicked world will be forgotten someday. Heaven and earth, the totality of all things, heaven and earth, indicates a complete renovation and revolution in the affairs of the world and the spiritual reality. The personal application is for me to forget all the past, forget all the old, forget about all those things I want to hold on to. Well, you don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand what I did. You don't understand how my family treated me. No, be done with all that and go forward in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the answer to the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in the heaven. That means application in your heart, how it's going on in heaven to go on in your heart, through your mouth and through your touch, and in your home, on earth as it is in heaven, and in our town, in our state, in our nation. That the heavenly would come and touch down on the earth, that we would see more and more of Jesus' impact in our world. So our answer is prayer and preaching and God's power. Prayer is not an option. Prayer is a must for this nation and for this world. But the politicians are corrupt. Almost all of them are. And my prayer is that God will remove the wicked from office. Why does God allow evil men to serve our nation and Congress and other government positions? Consider the story in the Old Testament of Nebuchadnezzar. He had a dream. He had a dream. But he forgot it. So he commanded his deceptive sorcerers and astrologers to tell him what his dream was. They couldn't do it though. They couldn't do it. They failed to tell the king what his dream was. So Daniel was called in. And Daniel prayed. And Daniel prayed. And Daniel, he's a man of the hour. And he's coming forth. And God revealed the king's dream and interpretation to Daniel. The man of the hour, the man of God came on. And look what he said in Daniel 2, verse 20 through 21. This is what he said. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. In the next verse on your outline, Proverbs 21, verse 1. Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Who removes kings? God. Who raises up kings? God. God Almighty controls a king's heart like water. Who controls every senator's heart? God. Who controls every mayor's heart? God. Who controls a judge's heart? God. God is in control. I do not need to fret or to worry. I know that God is in control. Hey, I read in the newspaper the other day, it records a man in the midst of severe trouble and pain. Absolute tremendous suffering. Suffering that probably none of us have ever experienced. And he said one thing. He shouted this, the article said. What is God? Not where is God. That's what most people usually say. But he said, what is God? Then he burst into tears, hung his head, and wept and cried, and cried and wept. What is God? The Bible tells us what God is. That God is spirit, infinite wisdom, power, and glory. One God in three persons. A Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is love. And he's just. And he's merciful. Engraved on the liberty bell is this. Leviticus 25. <clears throat> Proclaim liberty throughout all the land. To all the inhabitants thereof. Liberty comes from the gospel. Reverend George Mullenberg of Virginia. He appealed to its congregation. Right before <coughs> the outbreak of the revolutionary war. He appealed to his congregation in his last sermon. To enlist in the war. He wanted them to join the war. All the men. He preached there's a time for prayer, there's a time to preach, and there's a time for war. British opposition was raising up and bringing tyranny to America. The congregation rose to sing Martin Luther's, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Amen. Within a half an hour, over 150 men signed up of his flock. And the good reverend took off his minister's robe, and he grabbed his rifle, and he went to war. <coughs> Today, under the banner of Jesus Christ, I ask you, I urge you, I beseech you, become a man of love. Become a woman of love. Armed with love, the armor of love. Can you do it? Will you do it? 
Will you change? Will you understand that Jesus' love dwells in your heart right now by faith, that you can extend His love every single day? Every opportunity you walk into the door is a time to bring forth the love of Jesus into that situation. In your home, at your workplace, in your school, in the marketplace, everyone they need, they need Jesus. Oh, do they need Jesus, and they need His love. In 1851, there was a ceremony to mark the extension of the Capitol, to lay a cornerstone on that extension. And the President struck the stone three times in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the dedication. Inside the cornerstone, they set a document inside glass, inside a glass jar sealed, and it was written by Daniel Webster. The document stated this, I quote, The nation of the United States of America stands firm that their constitution still exists unimpaired. With hearts devoutly and thankful to God Almighty, we unite in sincere and fervent prayers that this deposit and the wall and the arches and the domes and the towers and the columns now to be erected, that God save the United States of America. God save the United States of America. What a beautiful ceremony on the Capitol Cornerstone. Yet the cornerstone was first laid in 1776 and even further back than that on a hill called Calvary when the cross loomed large over the whole world, so large that darkness came upon the earth and the Messiah died. Jesus died for all of our sins and from that truth and then his resurrection and ascension and his teaching on love, he changed the world. He conquered Rome with love, peace, and the gospel. And that went forth. In 1776 and we have a nation that has received so much don't ever think it's by accident it's by the providence of God Almighty we need a new dedication a new passion so my question to you in your own heart forget about everybody else in your life and what's going to go on tomorrow and next day and the next year and on and on until Jesus returns are you ready to be a witness of love are you ready to be a man or woman of prayer? Are you willing to tithe? Are you willing to keep the Lord's aid? Are you willing to be peaceful and loving? Are you willing to be virtue honoring? Are you going to be one who simply follows Jesus? Keeps it simple. Keeps it powerful. Keeps it loving. Are you going to make it complicated and tough and religious? Let us have such a cornerstone in Jesus. Nobody's like Jesus. Nobody ever loved like Jesus. Nobody ever did the miracles that Jesus did. Nobody ever had the proof and the evidence that Jesus had. You can't put the proof and the evidence in a box because it's so colossal it extends past the ceiling and on and on. Nobody had the evidence of the proof that Jesus did. Yeah. Nobody ever fulfilled the prophecies that he did. Nobody died on the cross for an eternal atonement like Jesus did. Nobody rose again on the third day like Jesus did. Right. Jesus is utterly unique. He changed history from B.C. to A.D. Jesus, He's the King. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He changed it all and He's changed your heart. Now let that heart that's been changed extend that love of Jesus to really, really, really see our world changed. God save the United States of America, our nation. Oh, thank you to restore this country, to be rendered and ascribed and reckoned all praise and all glory and all might and all honor and all majesty and all dominion, both now and forevermore, world without end, to God Almighty and God Almighty alone. So for us personally, on this July 4th week, how are we going to be those who are become more and more loving and worry and worry less about what's going on in our country because there's so much going on? Number one, here's a tough one, especially if you watch the news. Here's a tough one, but it's in the scriptures. Stop complaining. Look on your outline there at Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. You'll notice how God, He can speak in universal tones because He has universal knowledge. He's omniscient. Notice what He says. Do all things without complaining and disputing. That's all things. It's there. Not most things. Not just be consistent with it, but in all things. A French general was riding horseback and he heard one of his troops complaining. The soldier was saying, oh, it's easy for the general to command us to walk while he's on his horse riding in comfort. Then the general dismounted and commanded the soldier to get on his horse. 
Then going through a ravine, a bullet from a sniper struck the rider and killed him. And the general said, how much safer it is to walk than it is to ride. Seek to end your complaining. This is a tough thing for us. We do have so much in America. You go home to your air-conditioned house. You probably have a car. You're going forward. You have food in your pantry. We have so much. We need to stop complaining and start Amen. praying. Amen. Here's the key. When you when the complaint starts welling up in your heart, you want to say, oh, those politicians, or oh, these guys, or this, or even those close to you. Stop yourself and pray for that situation. It's tough, but you can make it a knee-jerk reaction that you pray instead of complain. Right. Do people think that you're a complainer, or do they think that you're a person of love? Secondly, be open to change. This is a tough one for a lot of us. We've been in a rut, and we've done things our way, and we get the same results over and over again. And if you're age 15, if you're age 30, if you're age 45 or 75, you can change. You can stop doing those same things over and over again, even right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at again at 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled faith, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, there's that looking to God again, are being transformed, that's a continuous process, into the same image from glory to glory. That's what the scripture says. The power to change your character flaws. What would you like to change about you? Just think about it. Let me put it another way. What would your spouse or your brothers or sisters or your parents like to change about you? That's proper and biblical. Finish this sentence. It's just like me to be blank. It's just like me to be impatient. Just like me to be hopeless. It's just like me to feel shame. It's just like me to always be late. It's just like me to worry. It's just like me to be ornery. It's just like me to always put my foot in my mouth. It's just like me to be undependable or depressed or whatever. Whatever it is, God wants to fill that blank when it's just like me to be more and more like Jesus. Amen. When that happens in your life, people will see it. They may not see it the first week. They might not see it the first month. But over a period of time, when they start seeing the touch of Jesus coming in your life, they start seeing the words of Jesus come from your mouth, they start seeing the love of Jesus coming from your heart, they will say, that lady, she's changed. That guy, he's changed. There's something about him. I don't know what it is. But don't know what it is in a year or two after you're walking in the love of Jesus. So not to worry about this country, you need to change yourself. Number three, on this July 4th week, how do we become loving and worry-free citizens? Do not worry about death. This is a tough one. This is the second biggest worry that most people have. The biggest fear is speaking publicly. The second one is death. Look on your outline, Psalm 23. Yea, or indeed, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen. When a man had just lost his young wife and he had three young children in his car with him, leaving the funeral of burying his young wife, he's got the three young kids and they're crying and crying as you can imagine. <coughs> uh, the young lady died so young. And he's a single man now raising these three kids in his car. And he's driving down the street. He doesn't know what to say to the kids. What can you say to them? And so all of a sudden a big truck drives by. And the shadow encompasses a car. And stays there for a while. And then the truck moves on. And he asked his children this question. He said, children, would you rather be run over by a truck or by its shadow? And the children said, well, of course, Dad. We'd rather be run over by the shadow. It can't hurt us at all. And then he said, did you know that 2,000 years ago, the truck of death ran over the Lord Jesus Christ in order that only its shadow will run over us, including Mommy. She's with the Lord right now. Do not fret. Do not worry. She walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and the Lord was with her. Number four, that you pray for God's purpose for you. Not just for your family, not just for your church, 
not just for your nation, but that you would have an understanding that you have a supreme destiny, that you're more than conquerors. That's what the Word says, and the Word is true. Everyone in Christ has a marvelous destiny, a destinated destiny. The Spirit of the living God is in you, and you're in the Spirit of the living God if you're a Christian. Right now, you can have perfect peace because of that. There is a destiny, a purpose for you. And with that comes not merely unguided fate, but a purpose in Jesus of love, power, and joy, a destiny in you. We're going to talk about that next week for four weeks, Lord willing. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon.